And so uh, I'll introduce Gulai Turkmen, who's um, uh, a, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Graz and uh, focuses a political sociologist focusing on um, historical and cultural questions of belonging and identity, the, the themes that have indeed animated the, the Landecker seminar series over the course of the term. This is, I believe, our last seminar, um, but uh, we do have a, an upcoming seminar series on, on ethnicity and religion. Um, is that right, Marietta, in, in, the, um, in the autumn term? So um, let me then turn over um, to, um, and also to introduce um, the, our, our discussant, who is um, Erdi Osturk, who's a lecturer in politics and international relations at the London Metropolitan University. So the way that we're going to run today is that um, Gulai will start with a 20 a minute in kind of overview of the book and, and then we'll turn it over to Erdi for 10 minutes of thoughts and then, um, and then we will open it up to uh, discussion. So without further ado, um, uh, welcome um, Gulai and uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Maya, and thanks a lot, Marietta, for the organization and for everyone who is involved in the organization. Thanks. So I'm just going to be sharing my screen. I have a, a PowerPoint presentation here. So let me just turn this into a regular slide show. I think you all see, see it now, right? OK. All right, so um, again, thanks uh, to the organizers to, and uh, the, the, I'm gonna be talking about my book today, which has been published uh, by Oxford University Press in March, 2021, and um, is available for order at the OUP website, as well as on Amazon, if you're interested. I can share the link with you all during the Q&A session. Um, and it's titled Under the Banner of Islam, Turks, Kurds, and the Limits of Religious Unity. So even though I'll be focusing on the book during the presentation, I'm hoping that in the Q&A we can talk about the broader uh, implications of the book for uh, discussions on religion, nationalism, and ethnicity, not only in Turkey, but um, around the globe. Um, so for now, uh, let me start uh, by sharing with you the cover, which I'm in love with, but of course I'm biased. Um, so here is the cover and people have been asking me where this photo was taken, but the cover image is not a photo, it's a painting uh, by a painter from Turkey, Istan Oturmak, and it fits really well with the book's main theme as the book puts at its center Civil Friday prayers, Civil Juma Namazari in Turkish, which resembled this painting pretty closely as I'll show you in the next slide. And uh, these two photos were taken during Civil Friday prayers in Diyarbakir, a majority Kurdish city in southeastern Anatolia in 2012. And I guess the resemblance to the cover art is quite clear now. So what were the Civil Friday prayers and how did they inform the research that gave birth to this book? So Civil Friday prayers were initiated in 2011 as acts of civil disobedience by some Kurdish clerics in Turkey who demanded the right to be able to give the Friday sermons in Kurdish which was and still is prohibited in the country. For example, in this photo, the sign on the right reads in Turkish, those who deny our language cannot teach us our religion. And these prayers emerged in the midst of a period when both the ruling Justice and Development Party, AKP, and the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, highlighted Muslim fraternity as a remedy to the four decade long armed conflict between the PKK and the Turkish armed forces. And in this narrative, Sunni Islam was presented as an overarching supranational identity that could surpass the ethnic divisions between the majority Sunni Muslim Turks and Kurds. So Civil Friday prayers challenged the government's authority both politically and religiously, politically because the Friday sermon was given in Kurdish, religiously because they were held out in the streets rather than in state-run mosques, and in Turkey all mosques are state-run, and the Meles, the, the local name for imams, um, prepared their own sermons rather than reading the text prepared by the Presidency of Religious Affairs. And again, in Turkey, all of the Friday sermons are prepared by the Presidency of Religious Affairs centrally and they are sent to mosques from Ankara. 
and during the two years they were held, they became uh, the, the civil pridays were held, they became quite widespread in most Kurdish majority cities in eastern and southeastern Anatolia. And at their peak, they attracted around 5,000 people in Diyarbakir, aiming to highlight the ban on Kurdish sermons in particular and the limitations on the Kurdish language in general, they drew attention to the assimilation of Kurds in Turkey. And most importantly, along with other factors, they played an important role in forcing the state to give de facto permission to sermons in Kurdish, if not de jure. So intrigued by these prayers, in this book, I focus on the ambivalent role Sunni Islam has played in Turkey's Kurdish conflict, both as a conflict resolution tool and as a tool of resistance. Although the Kurdish conflict has historically been characterized by a secular nationalist ideology, both on the side of the PKK and on the side of the Turkish state, since the 1980s, different governments have at times resorted to religion to subdue Kurdish nationalism. However, none had advocated Muslim fraternity as strongly as the AKP governments have. Moreover, never before did the secular PKK with Marxist origins display as positive a stance towards Islam as it has during the AKP rule, especially during the peace talks that took place between 2012 and 2015. The role of religion has become so pronounced in the conflict that both Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the leader of the AKP, and currently the president, and Abdullah Öcalan, the imprisoned leader of the PKK, they went on to cite the same hadiths, Prophet Muhammad sayings, to emphasize Muslim unity and solidarity. Yet, in the summer of 2015, the ceasefire was broken, and in January 2016, Erdogan declared that the peace process is over for good. Since then, clashes have resumed, thousands of people died, and thousands have been internally displaced. Against this background, I inquire why Muslim fraternity has not resonated well among Sunni Turks and Kurds, especially among the religious elites. Using the Kurdish case as an opportunity to explore the intricate relationship between religion, ethnicity and nationalism, I scrutinize the role of religion in ethnic conflicts and ask how do religious, ethnic and national identities diverge and converge in religiously homogeneous ethnic conflicts? Is it possible for religion to act as a conflict resolution tool? Under what conditions? And more specifically, why is it that, despite the global increase in the importance of religion and despite the changing stances of the Turkish state and the Kurdish movement, the two parties have failed to unite under the banner of Islam? Um, in search for answers to these questions, I take the reader on a journey into the inner circles of religious elites from different backgrounds, non-state appointed local Kurdish meles, state appointed Kurdish and Turkish imams, heads of religious non-governmental organizations, members of religious orders and pious politicians. I rely mainly on participant observation in Friday prayers, systematic analyses of newspapers and politicians' speeches, especially those of Erdogan, and 62 interviews conducted over the course of a year between June 2012 and June 2013 in three different cities, Istanbul and the majority Kurdish Diyarbakir and Batman. In case there are people in the audience who are not familiar with Turkey's geography and Turkey in general, and who do not know where these cities are, here is a map of Turkey. So Diyarbakir and Batman are located in the southeastern part of the map, and this whole region uh, eastern and southeastern Anatolia is where majority of Kurds in Turkey live. And Kurds comprise around 15 to 20 percent of Turkey's overall population of 85 million. And in addition to this region, Istanbul also hosts a large population of Kurds. Hence my choice of Batman, Diyarbakir and Istanbul as cities to conduct research in. Um, so I conducted the interviews during a period when the peace process seemed to be moving smoothly and when core religiosity seemed to be quite influential in bridging the ethnic divide between Kurds and Turks, at least rhetorically. The interview data revealed that, in fact, Sunni Muslim identity was far from influential in uniting religious elites at the time, let alone motivating them to advocate for Muslim fraternity. One of the main reasons why Sunni Islam has failed to uh, unite Turkish and Kurdish Sunni Muslim elites, I argue, is the variation in how these elites conceptualize religious and ethnic identities. Almost all religious elites I talk to uh, agree that Islam can be implemented as a conflict resolution tool. Yet, because they diverge in their interpretations of Islamic teachings and in their conceptualizations of religious and ethnic identities, 
Islam plays much less an influential role as a peacemaker. To demonstrate this divergence among Turkish and Kurdish religious elites, based on my findings, I developed the concept of religio-ethnic identity, and I put forward a fourfold typology of identity categories as conceived by these elites. Religio-ethnic, ethno-religious, religious and secular ethnic. And I will explain all these categories in a bit with sample quotes to, you know, to give more detail. Because it, in this table it looks pretty complicated. <laughs> Um, and because these categories cannot be considered in isolation from the evolution of certain ideas and institutions since the late Ottoman period in Turkey, and the structural changes the political and religious fields have undergone since 2002, and the repercussions these changes have had on various actors, I claim that different identity categories, along with institutional and political changes, and the ensuing transformation of power and network relations have prevented Islam from acting as a unifying conflict resolution tool in the Kurdish conflict. And blending interview data with historical and institution, historical institutional analyses, I demonstrate the symbiotic relationship between the changes in the religious and political fields and the religious elites conceptualizations of identities. And, um, and to that end, I employ a theoretical framework that attends to not only micro-level identity formation processes or macro-level doctrinal debates, but also meso-level analyses of religious and political actors and how in their hands theological content might change shape. And in this presentation, I do not go much into theory, but I would be happy to answer any theory-related questions during the Q&A. Okay, so building on these findings and using the fourfold typology, in the book I first explain the secular ethnic category in chapter one. And I uh, display how secular Kurdish political elites envision ethnicity as a category completely detached from religion and how they deem as assimilatory the AKP's attempt to use religion as a unifying tool. The chapter opens with the analogy of green camelism used by some Kurdish political elites to criticize the AKP's Muslim fraternity project. This line of thinking claims that the AKP is no different than the founders of the Turkish Republic in its intention to assimilate Kurds and that it differs from the latter only in its employment of religion to that end, hence the allusion to green, because green is seen as the color of Islam. And the, the Kemalism is um, because Kemal Atatürk, the founder of the Turkish Republic, uh, it refers to uh, his um, uh, ideology and his followers. Um, and here is a lengthy quote from an HDP official I talked to in Diyarbakir. And HDP is the pro-Kurdish People's Democratic Party, the third largest party in the parliament, currently facing a, a closure case. A prosecutor in Turkey uh, wants to close the uh, party. So, um, I... I'm going to read the quote because I don't know if people have their screens on in Zoom talks. I am never sure. Um, so, Kurds in general have a quite positive attitude towards Islam. Yet, Islam has always been used as a tool of assimilation and oppression against the Kurds. Whether in the form of Turkish Islamic, Arab Islamic or Persian Islamic syntheses, those in power have always employed Islam to exterminate or dominate Kurds. That's why Kurds embrace a critical view of state Islam. AKP officials claim to be religious, but in practice they are far from that. Sorry, I cannot... Um, so sorry, I couldn't say. <laughs> Civil Friday prayers symbolize the Kurds' attempt to practice their religion without giving up their own culture and language. That's why the state finds them disturbing. By banning them, the state is saying, either embrace my interpretation of religion or I will not le let you practice any other version of religion. And um, he continues and he says, uh, in this sense there is continuity in the way the state has handled Kurdish demands. The hunters might have changed, but the prey has remained the same. In the past it was the Ittihad Teraki originating Kemalists who tried to assimilate Kurds, and nowadays it's the Islamists who ironically take pride in removing Kemalists from power. In my eyes, these Islamists are nothing but green Kemalists. So, to provide the historical and political background needed to make sense of this metaphor, the chapter then provides a detailed historical account of the role Islam has played in the Kurdish revolts 
and in the Ottoman Empire and the Republic of Turkey and how both have handled them since the late 19th century. Then in chapter two, I turn my gaze to the supranational religious identity and scrutinize the contour of the Muslim unity project. And this chapter demonstrates how the belief in Islam as cement comes to life in the discourse of several religious elites who, regardless of their ethnicity, characterize Sunni Islam as an overarching supranational identity and see Muslim fraternity as the only solution to the Kurdish conflict. They reproduce the belief that Sunni Islam could indeed bridge the ethnic divide between Kurds and Turks. Here's a quote from an interview I conducted with a state-appointed Imam in Diyarbakir, and you can see how much emphasis he puts on Muslim unity. And although this approach did not have that many followers among my respondents, only 7 out of 62, it's still worth scrutinizing in detail, as it provides the basis of the main research question I'm dealing with, namely the role of Islam as a supranational identity. Hence, uh, in this chapter, I tried to provide a better understanding of the origins of this approach and how and why it came to be embraced by the AKP. And here's another quote by another interviewee, a longtime member of a religious non-governmental organization uh, in Batman. He says, Turks and Kurds are united in Islam. Islam is the strongest link between us. That's what kept us together when the Ottoman Empire dissolved. Hence, we should cling to it. Allah warns us against Shiism. In Quran, he clearly asks us to not become divided. And then he uh, quotes a Quranic verse here. Hold firmly to the rope of Allah altogether and do not become divided. And remember the favor of Allah upon you when you were enemies and he brought your hearts together and you became by his favor brothers. And then he says, there is only one nation for me and that's the nation of Ibrahim, Abraham. So, um... And it's interesting that this interview was in Batman, and Batman was a city which witnessed not only the tension between, not only the conflict between the state and the PKK, but also the Kurdish Hezbollah, a Batman originated uh, Islamic group, and the PKK. They also uh, had clashes, and there were a lot of um, uh, people who died. So, um, despite all he has witnessed in the 90s, um, he still believes that Islam could be the only way out. And to provide some historical context, the chapter then goes on to analyze this discourse in relation to the Muslim Ummah and Ottoman pan-Islamism and demonstrates that rather than Muslim unity, actually Muslim disunity was the rule from the very beginning in Islamic history. And the reason some of my respondents think that implementing Islam as an overarching supranational identity might help unify Sunni Kurds and Sunni Turks lies in their nostalgic take on the Ottoman Caliphate. According to this account, the Ottomans handled the ethnic differences between Kurds and Turks much better because they implemented Islam as a unifying identity. And in assessing the validity of this claim, the book scrutinizes the Ottoman Caliphate and it, it says that this supposition is correct only to a certain extent. While Islam played a great role in unifying Ottoman Muslims against the empire's non-Muslim subjects, even the Ottomans were forced to recognize the ethnic differences among their Muslim subjects. And as such, although Islam was a powerful bond between um, the Muslim subjects of the Ottoman Empire, it was still limited in its ability to suppress ethnic differences. For example, the Arabs or the Kurds in the Ottoman Empire were still um, different and uh, they had conflicting claims. So in that sense, um, this uh, take on the Ottoman Caliphate was just nostalgic and it didn't really have any factual basis. And I argue that this nostalgia for a peaceful Ottoman past also constitutes, constituted the core of the AKP's insistence on presenting Islam as the solution to the Kurdish conflict. And in the last section of the chapter, building on systematic analyses of statements, by, mostly by President Erdogan, I demonstrate how the AKP came to embrace a pan-Islamic solution to this conflict, and what steps it took towards accomplishing it, and how its attitude towards Kurds compared to that of Ottomans towards its Muslim subjects. Especially Erdogan's Muslim Turkish citizenship, I say, was way too reminiscent of Abdul Hamid II's Muslim Ottoman citizenship. Um, uh, they both reject a secular understanding of citizenship, swapping Ottoman with Turkish, Erdogan envisioned a Turkish citizenship that includes all the different ethnic groups living in Turkey, as long as they are Sunni Muslims. 
And um, however, AKP's approach and this conceptualization of a unifying Muslim identity has not been successful in the end. Um, and in chapter three and chapter four, I present religious, ethnic and ethno-religious identities as important reasons for the failure of the Muslim unity project. Chapter three introduces religious, ethnic identity via focus on civil Friday prayers as contentious performances. And um, building on interviews with the civil Friday prayer imams, as well as observations from these prayers, it uh, presents these imams as autonomous agents of contestation who have turned religion from a tool of assimilation into a tool of nonviolent resistance. Though acknowledging Islam's capacity to unite, these imams are quite suspicious of the Muslim unity discourse, and by quoting Quranic verses and hadiths that highlight ethnicity as a religious God-given identity, they claim that rejecting one's Kurdish identity and assimilating into Turkish culture means going against God's will. Hence, rather than the ethno-religious approach, these imams promote a religious ethnic identity, which traces the origins of their ethnic identity back to religion. Um, as such, religious ethnic identity functions as an important reason for the weakness of Islam as a unifying identity in Turkey. And you see here some quotes from these imams. Um, and uh, I'll just read maybe the first one. The Prophet has made it clear that no race, no ethnicity can have superiority over another except by piety. What makes the Turks think that they are superior to us? And Turkish Muslims keep saying we are religious brethren. However, in their eyes, we are brothers so long as they are the elder brother. Um, so you can see these, um, em this emphasis on uh, how like Turkish Muslims keep prioritizing Turkish identity. And chapter four revolves around this and um, it presents ethno-religious identity that I spotted among mostly Turkish Muslims. Um, and uh, the chapter argues that another reason the idea of Muslim unity does not work well in the Kurdish conflict is the strength of Turkish nationalism among Turkish religious elites. And it displays how these uh, religious elites who seemingly advocate Islamic unity end up privileging Turkish ethnic identity upon further interrogation. While they discursively promote Muslim unity, in practice they advocate a Muslim identity very much shaped by Turkish nationalism. And the elites in this category are usually comprised of state-appointed Turkish imams and some Turkish Muslim elites, especially those associated with the Gülen movement. And instead of talking about ethnicity as a God-given identity, they focus on the Quranic difference between negative and positive nationalisms. And they claim that most of the Kurdish imams practice negative nationalism, which is separa separationist and which is forbidden in Islamic teachings, they say. And to back their argument up, they usually refer to certain Quranic verses that emphasize the brotherhood of Muslims. And here on this slide, you see a quote by a state-appointed imam in Diyarbakir. Um, the only nationalism Islam accepts is positive nationalism, which emphasizes the brotherhood of all Muslims. It sees all Muslims as equal and does not distinguish between them. Hence, what we need to do is to establish a Muslim union. The question is, which country can establish and lead such a union? None of the Arab states can do it. Indonesia, Iran or Pakistan can't do it either. Only Turks can accomplish this because they actually ruled the Muslim world for 600 years, alluding to the Ottoman Empire here. And um, here's another quote by a Turkish Gilan moment member. He starts by an emphasis on Muslim unity, but as he progresses, one can see how he prioritizes Turkishness and looks down upon Kurds. And with the help of a historical overview, in the chapter, I explain in detail how this attitude and endurance of Turkish nationalism among Turkish Muslims has its roots in the formation of the Turkish nation state as a Sunni Muslim entity from the very beginning. And it then turns its gaze to the Turkish Islamic synthesis and goes back as early as the mid-19th century to trace the emergence of Turkish nationalism and its merger with Islam. And the second part of the chapter scrutinizes how the AKP's discourse on the Kurdish conflict has oscillated from one characterized by Islamic Turkish synthesis to one characterized by Turkish Islamic synthesis, because recently it turned towards nationalism, uh, ultranationalism. Uh, prioritizing Turkishness more. And, um, and I, I uh, present some systematic analyses of newspapers and public statements in this chapter uh, to document how the AKP has replaced its emphasis on Muslim fraternity with an emphasis on Turkish Muslim nationalism. 
So while the different conceptualizations of ethnic and religious identities by Sunni Muslim Turkish and Kurdish elites have definitely played an important role in preventing their unification, it would be misleading to claim that it is the only reason that has hindered the deployment of religion as a peacemaker in Turkey's Kurdish conflict as identity categories do not exist in a vacuum and they are historically and politically grounded, I contend that related structural factors should also be taken into consideration when discussing this issue. The spillover effects of the civil war in Syria, especially the establishment of an autonomous Kurdish region, Rojava in northern Syria, the historical trajectories of both Kurdish and Turkish nationalisms in Turkey, the non-transparent nature of the peace talks and the continuous mistrust between the government and the Kurdish movement, the vital role played by secular nationalist actors on both sides, and the importance of Alevi Kurds in certain Kurdish majority regions and in the upper echelons of the Kurdish movement. And but, uh, last but not least, the HDP's decision to not support Erdogan's bid for presidency are all among the factors that have contributed to the termination of the peace process in the summer of 2015. And in such an environment, it was quite hard for Sunni Islam to act as the cement it was envisioned to be. Thank you so much for listening to me today. I'm three minutes over the 20 minutes, sorry. <laughs> but I'm um, very much looking forward to hearing your feedback, comments, questions. Great. Um, please, if you thank you so much, Gurlai, for a really um, nice overview of, of the book and distilling each of the chapters. Um, if you can, please turn on your videos for the discussion, and I'll turn it over to Erdi now for um, 10 minutes reaction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya, and thank you to Marietta and Maya again for inviting me to discuss that wonderful uh, book. It was written from my colleague and my friend, Yulai, and I would like to thank Yulai to give that book as a gift to us, to the scholar of religion and politics, to the scholar of contemporary Turkish politics, because, I mean, uh, I would like to give a couple of plus points regarding the book in terms of theory, in terms of history, but beyond that, I would like to say a couple of things regarding the style of the book, first of all. I mean, uh, I know some of your, some of, uh, some of the uh, audiences uh, from, from the conferences, uh, from my, my network, but at the same time, I cited most of you a lot. Therefore, in front of you, I mean, making a critics, uh, making a comment uh, with my books. If, if I'll make any mistakes, please excuse me, but what I know in that kind of anthropological studies, there are two types of books. One is quite straightforward, quite in terms of quote unquote boring books. And the others, while you are reading books by reading and traveling into the pages, you will travel, you can travel into the streets, into the uh, into the environments that have been conducted research for the book. And within this book, I never ever been in Yerbakir, I never been in Batman, but I've realized that I was I was able to walk the streets of the Yerbakir and conducting that interviews because this the language, the shape of the book is quite fascinating. And I wish I had to read that book previously uh, before publish my book and most probably I'll copy some stylistic issues uh, for my own writings. This is the first one. The second thing is that, I mean, uh, this is, I mean, in the in the in the field of religion and conflict resolution, religion and armed conflict, uh, in the general literature, I mean, we were Jeffrey Haynes previously, but after that, Jonathan Fox, Justin Cesare, Peter Hemne, they have been mostly talking about how religion can be a useful glue for main and particular ethno-religious conflicts all around the world. On the other hand, what we know that mostly the University of Notre Dame's uh, scholars, Pete, uh, Scott Appleby, Daniel Philpot, they realized the ambivalence nature of religion. And previously, to the best of my knowledge, not that size of book or that size of study, combined that most two, two arguments and imply one country cases. And as far as I can, as far as I can uh, see, July did it in a very fascinating way. This is the contribution to the general field. Secondly, I mean, if you ask me, I mean, what, what are the biggest issues of the contemporary Turkey's politics? Definitely, I will say that the first one is religion and politics. 
The second one, I mean, there is a big competition between them, Kurdish issue. And then we will, we can continue about identity, nostalgia, I mean, the, uh, the, the problem of the political representation, so on and so forth. But two big issues are quite important. And previous studies, what we know from Professor Mehmet Yusuf, Yunesh uh, Murat Tezger, mostly quantitative scholars trying to combine and trying to scrutinize how religion can be important to solve that conflict or not. But in here, July, putting our, our, our only one focusing lens is literature to another side. And this is the other uh, contribution to the, to the macro field of the contemporary studies on Turkey or Kurdish issue. Uh, beyond that point, I mean, what we know that Turkey has been living in a very ontological identity problem for a long while, most probably since the late Ottoman Empire period. And this Turkey's ontological identity problem is not only related uh, with Turks, it is also related with Kurds. It's also related with all other components of Anatolia, of the Balkans and Mesopotamia. And July, and the uh, in page 18, I, uh, I'm not sure whether you have the book or not. I'm the lucky person to have the book. Uh, in page 18, which is the main backbone and the skeleton of the book, July defined religion ethnic, ethno religious, religious, and secular ethnic identity connotations of Turkey. And if, if you stop reading on the page 18, you can see that these are single columns and they're not combining each other. But on the following pages, what we saw that these are very blurb and abstract identity connotations and they've been creating intersectionality. And these intersectionalities are basically the problematic focal points of the contemporary Turkish politics right now. In terms of that side, if you are not related with the Kurdish issue, if you are not related with the Turkey's religion issues, but if you would like to work on the contemporary Turkish politics, this is one of the books you need to look at it from my point of view. And in this regard, the, the, the book's other strong part is that, I mean, how we can, how, where would we start regarding the Kurdish issues and reassurance in the history of the contemporary Turkey? Starting from the Kemalist period, early Republican era, or starting from mid uh, 20th centuries or 1980s? No, instead, it is better for us to start from the late Ottoman Empire period because without understanding that uh, historical backbone, it's impossible for us to understand how different regimes different political leaders, even the sultans, used religion as a useful sociological glue or as a separation tool. So in here, what we saw that, what AKP, Erdogan, or what the Gülen movement, a uh, big coalition partner of Erdogan just before 2013, and other religious communities, and also the Kurdish issue used religion both as a uh, as, a, as a kind of a glue and also a separation tool. Therefore, I mean, we've been always talking about the Turkish modernities. There was a motto, there has been continuity and capture. But in this story, we can also observe big continuities, but also dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, captures. They are the main critical junctions of all of these issues. Uh, but after that, like main, 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 main tools, I think I also found a couple of minor issues quite interesting and important. Uh, for a long time, for, for a long period, we have been talking about one concept regarding Turkey's activities in the Balkans, in the North Africa, and even in the Caucasus, with a combination of the idea of Eurasianism, which is called Neo-Ottomanism. No one knows that exactly what Neo-Ottomanism means because every single political leader, every single political ideology, ideology has it is often very uh, subjective Ottoman nostalgia and therefore they've been creating their own unique Neo-Ottomanisms. But in here, what we saw that Neo-Ottomanism is not only a uh, political tool, political concept, it's not an ideology, it's not a doctrine, I think it's a political tool, to use in foreign policy, for us, 
I mean, for, for all of us, it is better to read the neo-thermonical versions of the policy implementations in various issues. And in here, we can see it in the Kurdish conflict. The other thing is that Turkish Islam, I mean, even though Turkey is the, like, the navigator of the Ottoman Empire and the, the uh, holder of the caliphate more than 300, uh, more than three centuries, but Turkish Islam is something very unique. And what we realize that, even though we talk something about Turkish Islam, there is also a Kurdish Islam at the same time. And we, it is very rare for us to see what is this, what is the, uh, what is the, almost invisible but very big uh very but almost in invisible but, but playing a very big indicator in terms of the separation between kurds and turks so in this book we can also see the big differences between kurdish understanding of islam and turkish understanding of islam and also their intersectionality so in terms of to understand the religious codes and the religious notions of anatolia and also some part of the Middle East. It is also very important book for, uh, for us. Uh, in here, I mean, maybe if I would write that book, I can add a couple of points. These are not criticism. I mean, every 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 study has its own gaps or not gaps actually. It's impossible to cover every single uh, issue in one single uh, one single book. But I mean, the the point is that. It is a great book for all of us. It's been very much related with all of these issues, but it would be very good to see uh, much more clarifications with some, uh, some, some key actors, such as Gula Moment. I mean, yes, we can see a one big, large footnote, and I really appreciate Gula's academic, uh, ethical uh, priorities while categorizing all of these very critical actors, because, for example, as a Turkish scholar who has been holding a Turkish passport, talking about the Gulen moment is a very risky issue. I mean, it's not important that you are living in Germany or in UK, in, in New Zealand. It's not important. If you're talking about that critical issues with that kind of authoritarian uh, regime, it's very risky. But Gula in here put herself as a researcher position beyond every single limit and define the movement very well. But it would be very good to see the uh, these movements or these other actors' uh, details much more uh, in, in the book. Here, one, one last point, and then I'll have a couple of questions and then uh, leave all of you to, to, to discuss. Uh, the, the, the good point is that, I mean, I know Turkey and I know how to hard for a female researcher, particularly to conduct the research in the hot days of uh, Anatolia, in Diyarbakir, in Istanbul, in Batman, and being a female, I don't know Gülen's ethnicity, but I can uh, capture that she's not Kur the Kurdish, therefore it is also very difficult. I'm not sure whether she knows the language or not, but this is also another priority and other difficult issues. She conducted 62 interviews very wisely, but it would be fascinating to read a couple of pages uh, regarding her, her ethnographical uh, experiences. I mean, okay, snowball sampling, I mean, using a journalist for a link for to reach that researchers, but I would really like to hear your adventures. I mean, there should be very anecdotal uh, points that would also give an idea for the, uh, for, the, for the early career researchers because conducting research on Islam, on Muslim, is very difficult for female scholar. And also conducting research in Islam and Kurdish issues and in Turkey, it is it should be very, very difficult. So these are two minor points regarding the book. And actually, I have just two two questions. I mean the very book briefly. <laughs> yeah, very briefly. Sorry for that. The book, uh, the book. I mean, not ending actually in 2016. We in the conclusion part, we know some uh, issues about 2018 also. But Turkey, particularly after the failed coup attempt, in every single six months or three months, passing another critical junction, and every single critical junction is a very big determinant for the future of Turkey and for the future of region. 
What would be your new conclusion if you would like to finish that book right now in the 21st of uh, June 2021? Because every single day we have been, Turkey has been experiencing new issues regarding the role of religion and the Kurd in the Kurdish issue. And the other thing is that, if I'm not mistaken, in the region, more than 15 Sunni Islamic religious community is also playing a very dominant role. Not only Bektashis, not only Naqshbandis or Gülen movements. And I didn't see that much insights in the book regarding their role during particularly the peace process. I, and I really wonder uh, that point. And all in all, I would like to congratulate you. I wish that book has got lots of citation, lots of good reviews, and it deserves uh, all the best. Thank you so much for, for, for invitation. And Gilai, thanks for that book. Thank you. Thank you, um, Erdi, for a wide ranging set of comments. So before I turn it over to Gulai, I wanted to take the chair's prerogative to ask a kind of broad question. So I'm not a scholar of, of Turkey, but I am a scholar of comparative nationalism. And so I just wanted to ask um, from the perspective of broad comparisons, um, you know, you, you, in frame this book in terms of asking a question. And I read that question as why does Islam kind of fail to unite Kurds within the banner, within the folds of a kind of increasingly religious state? And, you know, when I first read that framing, my response was, well, why, why is that surprising, right? As somebody who works on South Asia, um, you know, Islam failed to unite Pakistan, which was once West and East Pakistan, and then became Pakistan and Bangladesh. In fact, that was a case where ethnicity was the rallying point for a separatist movement, which eventually became an independent country. But it's this not, you know, it doesn't have to be a story of Islam. I mean, you know, in Myanmar, Buddhism has failed to unite um, the state with kind of uh, regionally ethnic, ethnically diverse Buddhists. So in a sense, I guess the, que the question could be turned around to ask, you know, kind of why is this surprising that states don't, don't unite? And the real question I wanted to push to you was theoretically, what is this book a case of when one thinks broadly? Because you end the book by talking about you know, potential comparisons with kind of Christian countries, Spain and Catalonia and so forth. So when you think, look beyond Turkey, what do you think this is an example of? So, and let me offer three things that I think, three potential takeaways, which I think, um, which you hint at in some ways in which I'm not sure which one you want to kind of push for. And I'd love to, love to hear which one. So the first one is, um, is this a case of a particular ethnic identity being linked to kind of divine authority? So one thing you talk about, right, is the Kurds say that their ethnicity is actually also divinely sanctioned and that it's actually prioritized religiously. So is it about the ability of an ethnic community to claim that more broadly, divine authority for its ethnic identity? Second, alter, and alternatively, but not necessarily, you know, entirely um, separately, is it a case of really a power struggle between elites, between a, kind of the elite that's in control of the state and regional elites? And then a third possibility is, is it actually linked to the structural changes that you put up on that slide, which is, the weakening grip of the secular state and the increasing autonomy of local religious elites. So as the state moves, as Turkey moves away from secular foundations to an embrace of religion, necessarily religious elites gain more power. And so is it kind of a fallout from those structural changes? And I think I'll just stop there, but I'd love to hear you know, is all, are all of those things true? And if they're all true, then what are the most important theoretical drivers of the failure of Islam to unite? I'll just turn it over to you. Maybe you can just answer a couple of the points that Erdi and I have raised, and then we'll open up the floor. And feel free, those of you who are here, to put your comments 
um, in the in the chat or and or raise your hand as you as you wish. Okay, thank you so much uh, for um, these very detailed comments, RD, and thank you so much for your questions, Maya. Um, so maybe I'll start uh, from Maya's uh, questions and then uh, go back to RD's comments and questions. So. Um, yeah, um, when I first started the, the, the book and when I first asked that question, like, um, you know, why is uh, this even surprising was something I also <laughs> struggle. But then again, in the Turkish, um, in the Turkish case, at the time when I first started the research, Islam was um, like in media, in political discourse, in, in civil society, it was presented so much as a glue and when the civil friday prayer started i was like but look this uh, apparently it is not a glue like these imams are you know uh trying to show something demonstrate something else that it doesn't really hold these identities together and um and that's when i first went to uh, the arbuker to talk with these imams and to see what's happening there and this, again, this was a period when the peace process seemed to be moving smoothly. So people were, um, and this under the banner of Islam, the quote, uh, actually it's a quote that comes from Abdullah Öcalan, the leader of the, the PKK. And even Abdullah Öcalan, who is, who is a secular Marxist figure, he was talking about how Turks and Kurds could unite under the banner of Islam. And um, this was an attempt to actually, on my side, to display that it is not actually you know a, a, a possibility and on the ground it is not uh, it's something like what's happening is uh, far um, away from uh, the discursive like the discursive unity of of islam and um and in that sense uh, in chapter two i actually go uh, in, into detail in this like when i look at islamic history like starting from uh, very early uh, days of um, Islamic history, I'm trying to show that, you know, this Islamic disunity was actually, from the very beginning, that was the norm. Like, the, the, we don't really see this, like, this ummah, this, uh, as a, you know, like, as a utopic idea, it's always there, but you don't really see it being implemented. Like, it has always been confronted by several ethnic, national, tribal differences. And, um, and in that sense, um, I think like that's a, uh, that's a fair question. And that was a question that I was trying to highlight in the Turkish context, because at the time, everyone was so hyped about this, like, oh, like Islam can act as a unifying tool, as a conflict resolution tool. So this is like a kind of like an invitation on my side for a reality check. And I'm like, hello, like, look at the history and <laughs> look at what's happening on the ground. So this is not really, uh, you know, like what we, we see and what uh, we have witnessed over uh, time. And in terms of um, theoretically, what is this a book uh, of? I think all those three um, uh, three possibilities that you listed, it is a combination of all those. But uh, but mostly, I engage with this um, boundary making literature in sociology, the the uh, you know like symbolic boundaries, um, especially uh, Andreas Wimmer's um, I think boundary making, and um, and in that literature, I try to intervene by saying that sometimes even in that literature like ethnicity and religion gets conflated and um, when we conflate those then it really becomes analytically very difficult to um, to analyze for example a case like the Kurdish conflict where um, ethnicity and, and religiosity do not necessarily overlap because when you look at for example the conflict literature like when they are talking about the Palestinian um, conflict or the Ireland, like Northern Ireland, it's uh, these are cases where ethnicity and uh, religious identity overlap. So um, most of the time, scholars uh, they tend to just talk about ethnicity and religion as replaceable um, in these analyses. And I'm trying to show that you know ethnicity and religion they uh, yes they overlap at times, but they also um, they are very distinct at certain in other cases. And um, I'm glad you brought up the um, case in the uh, in the conclusion. I touched very briefly upon uh, the Basque 
conflict, for example, and how that could be another case where we can actually um, kind of look at this this relationship between ethnicity and religion and whether, you know, the Catholic clergy in the Basque case, for example, in the Basque conflict, how, like, what role they played and how they conceptualized these identities. So it was um, in terms of the, the uh, you know, ethnic identity being divinely sanctioned, I don't know if this would only be something that's unique to Islam, because these Imams, they kept uh, referring back to Quranic verses, but I think it would come up in other, um, other religions as well. Um, so I, um, I don't think it would be something that would only be, you know, that would only be observed in Islam, but of course I haven't done research on it. Um, and, and of course it's also a case of power struggles and that's why I bring in that like political field, religious field and how, because I use Bourdieu actually for that and I'm, I try to show that actually this is a, a, this is a struggle over whose knowledge is more authentic, who has, you know, like who has, um, kind of like this, who is governing the field, the religious field. Um, and I, I use like Bourdieu's field theory uh, to um, explain in further detail these power struggles between the elites and how that's connected to the weakening grip of the secular state. Because once you see that weakening grip, then we see all these like um, uh, debates among religious um, elites about whose interpretation is more authentic, who is religious knowledge is more authentic. Um, so I think it's a combination of all three um, in, in, in that sense. And Erdi, thank you so much. I mean, thank you so much for your, uh, your, like your praise of the book. Like, um, and I'm very humbled and uh, thanks. Um, but uh, in terms of your questions, um, so the, the um, let me start with the uh, positionality as my, uh, my positionality as a female, ethnically Turkish, uh, and, 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 and I'll just like self reveal here, agnostic researcher going into these, um, you know, like Kurdish, mostly male, I only had two uh, female interviews. And um, and Kurdish um, interviewees, so it was it was difficult, of course, um, especially because um, there was too much suspicion. And I was doing a PhD in the United States at the time, and when I told them I'm coming from the U.S., they were like, "Oh, are you a spy? Who is paying your money? Is it the U.S. government? Like, uh, so why are you here? You are not Kurdish. You are not religious. I, I mean, of course, I didn't tell them that I'm not Kurdish, but." But I could phenotypically, I could as well be Kurdish. Like, um, and they, some of them, they started talking to me in Kurmanchi, the the Kurdish dialect in the region. And I was like, I'm so sorry, I don't speak Kurmanchi. Can we talk in Turkish? And all of them know Turkish because it is very much like the education system is in Turkish and and in the military, which is mandatory for all males in Turkey. Um, it's also like they they learn it. Anyways, but um, so. But then after, like this worked in both ways. At the beginning, it was like it raised suspicion. But then after they trusted me, then it became uh, they're like, oh, but look at you. You're not even Kurdish. You're not even religious. You came all the way from the U.S. to listen to us. Like, and you know, like there are people who are so close to us, but they don't want to listen to us. They don't want to hear, you know, our take on the conflict. So it kind of also created this um, ground for dialogue. Um, but of course it was, I mean, I have, um, I didn't include it in the appendix, but I'm now writing, a, a actually a, a book chapter, or maybe it's going to be a special issue on this very topic, like, um, my, um, experiences, my, uh, based on the, all these anecdotes in the field. Uh, and I'm hoping that it will, um, give more info about, uh, about those experiences and um, and what would be my new conclusion oh my god when I was writing the book I like at one point I was like okay I need to stop now because Turkish politics is like a roller coaster it changes every day not even every day like if you don't look at the news like four hours like things change radically so I was like, okay, I need to stop this at one point. So I said, I'm just gonna, um, you know, um, talk about uh, the end of the peace process and we'll stop there. 
but of course if if i were writing this book now uh it would have a much more pessimistic <laughs> conclusion i think um because especially because of the very ultra nationalist turn on the part of the akp and its allies it now has this coalition partner uh, the ultra nationalist um mhp which is the nationalist action party and uh this closure case against the hdp the pro kurdish parliament uh and the pro kurdish party in the parliament um and you know it will i mean not that i actually finish the book on an optimistic tone but i i call for a return back to peace nego negotiations and i now see that being very unlikely you know like in the near future but then again this being turkish politics one never knows like things change fast um and the other muslim communities you are right i mean i don't um I don't go into the, I think, the, the differences between Sunni Muslim communities that much and I could have done this, you are right, um, and it would have given the reader more, um, you know, like more info about um, who these like Sunni Muslim groups are. Um, and I talk about the Naqshbandi orders, especially, um, uh, and their influence in the Kurdish region. Um, but but with Gulen Momon or the Kadiri or or other uh, other or religious orders in the region, I think yes, you are right. I could have definitely provided um, more. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> um, so I don't see any questions, but Matthias, I didn't note that you in the chat had a had kind of a few comments. I don't know if you want to bring anything up from that. Actually, it's not. A question just sent me very often. Islam was called a tool, oh. and a tool for me is is a game, and I can justify anything on or the opposite if I use religion as a game. So instead of using the word tool. I'd rather recommend the core of Islam, not the tool of Islam. Does, does that make sense to you? Yes, yes. And I, and I can see why it might be disturbing or why it might be, you know, like, uh, because it looks like a functionalist tool, when, uh, a functionalist uh, take when you say tool, right? Like uh, a tool of, of, like tool for what? Um, but um it was mostly because i was in 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 dialogue with the literature on conflict resolution and you know i was kind of reproducing the uh, the expressions there mostly like oh, yes. the tool and so that's how it came into being uh, so my question uh to you Gulay, is really um maybe a slightly provocative question you i think you've been working with phil horsky who has been one of our previous uh presenters here at um here at the landaker seminars and i think one of the things he was talking about was his rise of white christian nationalism and i've had a bit of an inkling that it sounds actually quite similar to what you're talking about with ethnic uh rel religious uh, nationalism so i'm just wondering what conversations you have had uh, in comparing these concepts if if at all but also what the critical discourses are that may be emerging already in Turkey that might be drawing on some of the critical theory um, that comes out of the US and other places. Um, I'm not familiar with this with this body of scholarship, but I would be really fascinated to um, to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, shall I answer or do we collect questions? Let's, let's collect a few because okay. I didn't realize quite how many hands there are. So. Um, uh, Sam, you didn't have your hand up, but I noticed that you had with your question addressed. Well, yeah, I mean, as I was typing it, she was answering it, which was brilliant, but uh, maybe more detail if she wants to go into uh, about the debate within uh, the Kurdish community, but I'll leave that. Great. And then um, uh, Mehdi will take you next and then Erdi. Thank you, Maria. Kolai, thank you very much. Very insightful and an interesting um, presentation. I'm rather surprised that um, Abdullah Ocalan, who as a head of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, 
it actually suggested or proposed uh, using um, the religious tool or Islam as a mediator because I always thought that uh, Ochalan was a secular, was a secular person. And taking Maya's uh, point that uh, Turkey is, has been, still is a secular state, although there's been a move away in, at the time of Odegaard, Odegaard that uh, move away from secularism. But I find that uh, quite surprising that he actually had proposed that, that notion. I wonder if it may have been the um, uh, choice of last resort in the way that he's come to a, to a cul-de-sac and he could not see any other way out. And either he was playing for time or, uh, or what, because I, as I said, I hadn't come across that notion previously. Uh, I'd actually find that quite um, um, somehow to me surprising. But one other question that I have is, um, I think again, uh, Maya or, or, or even Erdi had uh, sort of stated that more than alluded to is, we have not seen any examples of religion entering into a conflict of ethnicity uh, and try uh, uh, anywhere and try to be able to solve it or try to actually progress and, 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 and bring about some sort of the resolution. I'm not quite sure where, again, where that grasp is I and mean, those people who actually put forward that that particular um, notion? That where are they coming from? Um, Erdi, do you want to ask yours, and then we'll go back to Greg. yeah, just just to, uh, like a couple of tiny questions uh, coming from Maya. Your your point. I mean, do you think July, I mean, you asked some question about the theoretical contribution. And do you think July, as of today, you mentioned about in the conclusion in 2018, but for 2019, 2020, and 2021, I think we can see right now religion is a kind of a separation tool uh, for, for that conflict. I mean, you mentioned whether it is a kind of a glue separation, but right now I think we are quite clear in here what you think about that. And this is a semi-question, semi-remark. I think using tool is quite uh, okay for that case because it is very much related to the ambivalent structure of instrumentalization of religion between different two power groups. Do you think it is, it is I think it's correct to use tool. This is all. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you so much uh, for the questions. So, um, I mean, um, again, I'm going to start with uh, like backwards to um, so with Erdi's comments. Yes, I mean, I think both on the side of the state and on the side of the PKK, religion was very much seen as a tool. Yes, like they were not necessarily, you know, like sincerely uh, being, uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, represent religion or uh, I mean the AKP has very much instrumentalized religion for its own purposes political purposes um, and um, this also uh, this would talk to Mehdi's question about Öcalan using religion but and, and uh, on Öcalan's side too I think he was being quite pragmatic and just instrumentalizing religion it is not that he really believes it I mean of course we don't we can never know right like i mean th this will be um we can only speculate but um i personally think that he was instrumentalizing religion and and there is uh, it was not only because it was his last resort but uh, more than that also the kurdish uh, population is quite religious i mean even though the pkk is a very secularist marxist organization among its uh, among the kurdish constituency 
you see the influence of religion a lot and they are very devout uh, and, and pious and uh, in general like this is what we see so i think it was not only because he was forced to uh, you know instrumentalize religion because in his negotiations with the state it would give him a, an upper hand but also his base also kind of pushed him towards that um and um and in terms of uh, where uh, this um, claim is coming from, um, again, like uh, in the book, I talk about this like Ottoman Caliphate idea. And I think that is really like this distorted notion of um, Ottoman Caliphate being this unifying identity among Muslim subjects of the empire is so much ingrained in the um, especially among the this like Turkish Muslim community but the, not only them but also Kurdish Muslims like there is this you know like this very nostalgic belief in the Ottoman um, Caliphate but it is not factually true but still it's it is there and they um, kind of base there and it is very much influential among the AKP cadres as well like Erdogan and his um, followers um, and this goes uh, like this is uh, kind of come way through um, different generations through certain books that they read through certain journals which puts a lot of emphasis on this and I think that is where their belief in this like Islamic unity or this you know uh, Muslim Ummah led by Turks come from um, and uh, and Marietta to your question about Phil and uh, so Phil Gorski was my advisor at at Yale University when I was doing my PhD and um, and at the time he hadn't yet written about white Christian nationalism so it is a recent development um, but of course I mean my uh, my theoretical framework at least has been shaped very much by Phil's writings and the the, the conversations that we had and um, and one thing that came up in those in those conversations is that we realized even though Turkey and the US are super different in terms of state structure, in terms of like religious, um, you know, the religious plurality, religious market, there is still a lot of similarity in between two, um, two populations, at least in terms of how they define uh, national identity very much based on religious a certain uh, uh, sectarian religious identity um, or you know how um, a conservative take is very much dominant um, in the um, even in the daily conversations or on the you know like in media or political discourse um, so that was something that we were kind of both surprised to see like to, despite all these differences among these two countries you can definitely see um, and and in that sense I think this like this Turkish Islamic synthesis or Muslim Turkish synthesis it could definitely get in dialogue um, with uh, with examples from other countries uh, like the US in this case um, and there could be like a case for a comparative um, study and uh, that could emerge maybe in a more general theory of um, this and how you know like how this contributes to explaining the, you know, the the relations between nationalism, ethnicity, and religion in general. Okay, I think I managed to. Uh, did I miss something? Okay, if I did, please remind me. So I'm going to put myself back in um, the line for a question, and it it really picks up on this this last point you made of comparisons with other countries. The kind of interlinked nature between ethnicity, religion, and, and, and national identity. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, the extent to which kind of founding Turkish nationalism um, smuggled in kind of ideas of religion to begin with. So let me just again give you a few comparisons by, mm -hmm. by, by point of, by way of kind of getting into this. Question. So, right, Israel is an interesting case of a country that has been founded as a homeland, right? It's a very homogenous religious homeland, but it wasn't founded, right? The Zionist movement was not fundamentally a religious movement. Mm -hmm. You know, you can think about, and so, 
you there are lots of examples of countries that are secular, right, in some sense of that word, that being a broad term in and of itself, but actually smuggle in to some extent kind of national and um, kind of a religious identity. So one could argue Indonesia is another case. It's a country in which, um, you know, the founding national narrative is Pankashila, and one of those five pillars of Pankashila is, um, re, you know, religious belief, but it's not Islam, right? So there's kind of, there's some space, some daylight between the two. And I think, you know, what's so interesting about Turkey is that, you know, it, I, I think people disagree about the extent to which there's change, but I think everyone agrees that there's some change in terms of moving towards religion and the embrace of religion in the national identity. You know, and that's happening elsewhere in the world. Like India is just this prime case of that, right? Of this closer, starting with secular origins, but moving closer to religion. But you do have countries, like I would say, arguably Canada, that has moved in a direction of delinking ethnicity from the national narrative through. And, and, you know, the reason I asked, you know, again, about the political story is because that was driven entirely by a separatist movement of Quebec, which led the national leader to say, oh, you know, you're Quebecois Canadian. And then that means that we are, you know, uh, uh, English Canadian and you are native Canadian and you are Chinese Canadian and we're all Canadians. We all have hybrid identity, right? So these move, because national identities change so rarely from a, in a fundamental way, this question of start and the question of what is changing is I think a very important one. And I'd love to hear a bit more about mm -hmm. where you think Turkey is both in the founding moment and where it is now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that question, because I think it really is a key question to understand uh, what's happening in current day Turkey. Um, and, and I try to explain that in the book uh, by going back to the 19th century and the early 20th century and um, kind of talking about those uh, debates among the, found, the founding figures and how they define, for example, Turkishness, Turkish citizen, like what do we... What, who do we call a Turkish person? Like, and and there are all these. Actually, there is this really great book by Ceren Lord on all this, and she talks about. She looks at uh, parliamentary proceedings from that time and um, tries to see how Turkishness is defined, and um, and w what one can see is that actually, in contrast to what um, has been told so far by most. Uh, um observers of turkey it was not that secular even from the beginning like it, the turkish national identity was very much um kind of like framed as a sunni uh identity not even you know like not even just islam but very much a sunni identity from the beginning even by ataturk and um his you know like his close um uh, friends or founding figures let's say um, but they tried to do, um, and and again, I think Atatürk was also doing this on a very pragmatic basis. It is not that he really, but he knew that the population was quite uh, religious and he knew that you couldn't just like secularize the country from like uh, one day to the other. And, uh, but what they try, what they tried to do is Turkify Islam. So for example, they were uh, trying to um, introduce like um, call, the call to prayer it was Turkified, or the, the, there were translations of the Quran in uh, into Turkish. At one point, they even tried to, for example, they tried to change the um, the outfits of the imams. Uh, they uh, they suggested that the imams should wear like um, tuxedos rather than like there were all these crazy ideas about you know um, trying to westernize islam but also turkify islam and and there were all these like um kind of like revisionist history writing that put turks very much as the leader of uh, and as much more enlightened than the arab islam or you know persian islam so there was this really um emphasis on islam it was never actually kind of left out of the national identity. So the Turkish national identity from the very beginning, the, from the foundational moment, I, I, that's also what I argue in the book, was 
it was very much framed as a, as a Sunni Muslim identity. And that's why with the Kurds, they thought that as long as the Kurds don't highlight their ethnic identity, we could include them in Turkish identity. Um, but if they are willing to assimilate into that Turkish identity. So I think, and that's what we see in, in current day, in current day, because non-Muslims, they were never seen as Turkish, even though some of them have been living in the country for, I don't know, like, even before the Turks arrived, there were, you know, Orthodox um, uh, Greek living there. So it's like, really, um, there was no place for non-Muslims, non-Turks in this national identity. Marietta. Thank you, Gulay. Uh, Marietta. Uh, yes, thanks. I don't want to, to just jump the queue. If anyone else has, has questions, please do raise your hand. I think, Gulay, one of the things that um, I find myself wondering about is the relationship to orthodoxy uh, on the Balkans and Eastern Europe, where similarly we see a strong connection between peopleness, as it were, and uh, orthodoxy. And I think one of my questions would be, is this something that you see might be inherent to the to, to the legacy of the Ottoman uh, Empire? Or is this is this inherent to political theologies? How do you how do you see that? Because obviously Kurds and, and Orthodox peoples have, have both been part of the of the Ottoman Empire. I'm just wondering if that's a different angle of, of potential comparison to the more typical Western Christianity that people maybe are more often talking about. Um, I, mean, I haven't really talked with the, with the Orthodox uh, population, right? But Erdi might know much more about this because he's been doing research in the Balkans <laughs> about like the, and its versions of Turkish is like ter versions of Turkish Islam in the Balkans and how it uh, plays out with the with the non-Muslim communities there. So I don't know if he wants to chime in here, but I don't want to put you on the spot. But only if you no, want. no, no, no. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I don't want the uh, like present a pirate uh, pirate uh, presentation, but this is very much your question is very much related to Maya's question. Actually, there has been a heritage coming from the Byzantine Empire period. In the Byzantine Empire period, in the Constantinople, and this is the Maya's question: What is the difference between Israel and Indonesia and all of the stuff? In the Byzantine Empire period, in the Constantinople, there was a commission conseil that has been not dividing religion and state affairs, but controlling managing and regulating religious affairs on behalf of emperor. And in the Ottoman Empire period, Shehul Islam, the Shehul Islam is doing the same stuff for the Sultan. And in the uh, early Republican Empire period, even though Turkey state is not secular, is not laicite, there is no laicite, there is laiklik. And I'm insisting to use that laiklik because laiklik is very different than Anglo-Saxon understanding of secularism or other. There is not a separation between mosque and state. Instead, uh, the like leaking constitution is putting in the constitution 1936, uh, but Turkey founded an institution which is called Presidency of Religious Affairs right after six months of the establishment of the Republic. This institution is bigger than many ministries, is a giant institution and operating in more than 120 countries all around the world, controlling, regulating religious affairs for government or Erdogan. And in orthodoxy, okay, so within this mention, in Albania, in North Macedonia, uh, in, even in Bulgaria, uh, in, in some part of Serbia, there is a management of religion. So there is no crystal clear cuts between religion and religious field and political field. Therefore, Turkish case is unique. And Ahmed Cruz, uh, to the, I'm not sharing the very much the same ideas uh, regarding Gulay's uh, connotations of Jaren Lord's separation. I am from the other side of the uh, polarization. For example, in 2009, Ahmed Cruz's book, dividing the different types of secularism as Anglo-Saxon, French, and Turkish. It's Cambridge Press book, I think, cited more than 1,000 times. So this is a one of the mainstream. So sorry, and I'm shut, I'm putting silent. So I think this is really helpful because one of the things I've been wondering about is that, you know, and this is obviously a fairly old fashioned division, but the, the division between ethnic nationalism and civic nationalism where often the assumption is that, that in Eastern Europe, it is all based, belonging is based on ethnicity, and it's not so much to do with, with religion or culture, which 
you know, as I think I, I glean from, from Gulai's um, presentation is actually a misrepresentation of what is going on in uh, uh, in these in these areas. Uh, and I think Gulai, this is why I see a huge contribution to to the field in, in you being more specific in how we understand these relationships. And maybe there's still more categories uh, between ethnicity and religion to, to explore, but I, I find this really, really helpful uh, as a starting point for that conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I, I have another question, but I also don't want to jump the queue. Do you have responses and thoughts about that that you want to, to contribute? No, I'm good. I, I think if anyone else has any questions or you your question, I'm, I'm fine. Um, so, I mean, so I, it was actually on this point that, that Marietta brought up of kind of civic and ethnic nationalism, right? So. I think that there is has been a, a kind of muddying of the waters in terms of that very clear dichotomy and that understanding that often civic nationalisms do smuggle in. And you, to, to the point that Erdi just made that smuggle in building blocks that are ascriptive. Um, you know, the question is how how unique is Turkey as the former center of of you know the 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 kind of Islamic world. I mean, one could say, well, Italy was the former center of the Christian world, um, and you know, it, 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 perhaps further back, a few centuries further back. But you know, there was a very big struggle in Europe um, over you know the the kind of supremacy of religious elite or of of, of um, national elites over over religious elites. I mean, it's something that's sitting in Oxford, you know, you know your history of this institution, you know, it's a kind of microcosm um, of that struggle. And so is it, you know, is Turkey really that unique? Is it just closer and more proximate in time and therefore kind of exerts more causal kind of weight on, on the present that those debates are still, not, you know, very much there. But as someone who has, you know, German citizenship, um, and you know, has a kind of mixed heritage myself, in which my siblings look quite different from me. You know, it's very, it was very clear to me growing up in Germany that German national identity was linked to ethnic, you know, kind of ethnic belonging. And um, you know, and it, that that I escaped that perhaps more because I could pass um, as German in a way that my my siblings couldn't. Right. So I just I I think that this idea of civic and ethnic. It just it needs to be, it's not that it doesn't have analytic weight, it's just that it needs to be rethought of in terms of how do we actually categorize these things absent of the own kind of Eurocentric biases, which are often there. Well, I, I agree with you. I, I don't really necessarily, I mean, I am critical of that distinction myself. Like I don't go into that uh, that much in the book, uh, but actually in my dissertation, I wrote a whole section on uh, why I don't think that distinction holds and why, you know, we need to rethink that. And of course, I'm not the first person to say this, like, as you said, that has been already uh, voiced by certain scholars. Um, and in terms of Turkey being unique, I don't know if I, I if I would say that as strongly as Ardi uh, asserts. Like I I would uh, say that it is not that unique. But I maybe Ardi want to uh, jump in uh, wants to jump in after this. Uh, but um, especially because I think um, I mean you are definitely right in the sense that like there, this this power struggle between. Uh, political elites and religious elites it has been something that we could observe in other countries too. But um, in terms of the structure of nationalism that we see, there was recently this uh, very good article that came out, I think it was in American Journal of Sociology or one of those, I don't remember now. But like uh, they were looking at the, the, the past, like the, the traumatic past of, or you know, like, or, or if a country has uh, experienced um and any uh, like uh, soil loss you know like if they uh, if um they were uh, invaded or you know like all these uh, past experiences and how it informs the way they think of themselves currently and turkey is like it has this like um sev syndrome we call it like this um it was this agreement the sev agreement was um you know like during the at the end of first world war war 
uh, World War One. Um, it was being divided among, and so that kind of like that kind of scare, like fear, has been very much kept alive, and it kind of feeds into this like very much ethnic understanding of nationalism. I would say, like they are going to divide us, they are going to invade us, like even now, like I mean, it's very much alive, and um, and that prevents uh, this um, in a way. The formation of a more a more pluralist understanding of national identity um, of course that's not the only reason but I think that also like that that kind of like past and how in the past it was um, like these uh, experiences uh, traumatic experiences that also influences very much and, and in the case of Germany too right like you you find these um, like and again like in living both in the United States and in Germany and as a Turkish person I like I can definitely tell you the difference right like of course the United States has its own others but as like coming from Turkey like I'm very much aware of uh, being a foreigner in Germany than I was in the United States so like yes I, I, I definitely mm, I think that you know like that ethnic civic distinction um, doesn't necessarily hold but there are certain um, uh, points where you can definitely still see its uh, implementation on the ground great well um it just remains for me then to to thank you um Gulai, for really a lovely um presentation that covered so many of the rich empirical aspects of the book but then in the discussion really zoomed out to think about um, you know, theoretically, what are some interesting questions? What are some future areas for research? Um, and, and to Erdi for giving a really, um, you know, rich, provocative set of comments. So um, uh, let me ask you all to just quickly turn your, your um, microphones on and to give a kind of round of applause to Gulai. And, um, Thank you. Thank you all. And with that, draw um, the, the series for the year to a close and um, I look forward to hopefully seeing um, many of you and on our virtual series next year. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye bye. <laughs>